this position. World champion Gary Kasparov played a move that made history. In this video, I'm going to explain everything you need to appreciate the stunning beauty of this move. Kasparov ist mein Liebling Schachspieler aller Zeiten. That is German, and it means Kasparov is my favorite chess player of all time. And I learned how to say that with Babbel, the sponsor of this video, and also the best app for learning a new language. I am currently learning German because of chess words like Blitz, Zwischenzug, and of course the beautiful Zugzwang. So here's how I use the app. Let's go find my level. I'd like to practice my pronunciation a little bit. So let's go. And I'll see if, if I can do it as well. Der Flohmarkt. I could. Yay. Babel has been proven to be able to teach you a new language in just three weeks. So, if you'd like to learn a new language in a quick, easy, and effective way, it's a good thing that you watch ASMR chess, because Babbel has given me a link that's in the description of this video, and if you click it, you can get up to 65% off of a Babbel subscription. So, if you'd like to learn a new language while also supporting this channel, thank you. Go click the link in the description. So, here we are. It was in this position, in 1999, that world champion Garry Kasparov was facing Veselin Tupolov. At that time, he was number 10 in the world, so not a player to be trifled with. And it was right here that he noticed noticed something and he played a move that made sure that this game will forever remain in the history books. So let's go back to the start so I can show you how we arrived here. Kasparov opened the game with pawn to e4 and we saw d6 from Topalov. That is called the Pitts defense. Pawn to d4, taking control of all these nice attacking squares. And knight to f6, attacking e4. Knight f3, defense. And g6, getting ready Fianchetto this bishop on the long diagonal and already Kasparov starts to play against that. So in this position many of us would play knight to f3 because we are told knight before bishops but hold your horses, hold your horses. It's a little bun. <laughs> Kasparov actually played uh, bishop e3 getting ready to form a battery after bishop g7 with queen to d2 so that you can go down and exchange this very strong bishop. We see c6 from Topalov, f3 solidifying e4 so that after b5 Kasparov can play knight to e2 without worrying about this pawn pushing forward, attacking the knight. When the knight moves, we will lose the e4 pawn. Just nice calm opening. Does this look like the most impressive game of chess ever? Well, not yet. But Topalov plays knight to d7. 
bishop to h6 and Topalov actually takes that right off so so that he lures the queen close to his king why would he do that well he has a sneaky plan of making the queen offside over here he played bishop b7 and here we saw the first new move of the game up until now this was all known theory but here Kasparov played the novelty with a3 just protecting b4 Topalov plays e5 attacking d4 and castles long protecting the pawn with the rook queen e7 now we can do long castle like Kasparov and make the queen offside over here king to b1 a nice little subtle move to pile off plays a6 solidifying b5 and we saw a knight to c1 so there's room there now Topal of castles, Topal of castles long, and we see knight to b3. And now, after all this maneuvering, we see e takes d, and rook takes d4. c5 pushing the rook back and knight to b6 now we have one two three four pieces looking at d5 so it's clear to palov is going to be able to push the pawn forward and he's going to make a strong attack so we are getting position where Kasparov played the move that modern grandmasters consider the most impressive move in chess history. Kasparov played g3. Now the bishop can come out with a check. So the king prophylactically goes to b8. Now there's no check. Then Kasparov knight a5 attacking the bishop to palov says oh i need this bishop to protect you know all the light squares so the bishop drops back now bishop h3 just a little nice sniper bishop looking at c8 now the king can see the red dot can't quite get him yet, but it covers one of the exit squares. However, it is now time to play d5. Now this, this guy is backed up by everybody, the rook, two knights and a bishop. So there is no good way to capture this pawn. But Kasparov has a few tricks up his sleeve. This queen was a bit offside, so queen to f4 with a check to the king, and the king goes to a7. And now he plays rook on h to e1. Tupalov says, well, I, I wasn't going to take this pawn. There's no need to defend it. I was going to play d attacking the knight and threatening to move all my foot soldiers towards your king and trap him in his own castle the knight goes forward knight to e5 threatening the queen actually looking at both the knights as, as well so 
something has to be done about that. And Topalov just snaps it off with knight on b, takes d5. We see e takes d5, and this unveils a discovered attack from the rook towards the queen. So remember, when you play chess, don't look at the hand. Don't look at your opponent's hand. If you look at the hand, then you may think that this pawn move only has influence where the hand was. No, there's also the rook that can now see the queen. But to Palov plays queen to d6, and he's saying, well, you can exchange the queens, that's fair. Or I'll get this pawn. This is a super weak pawn you have got here. So I'm just going to capture that pawn. And I will be up a pawn. And this is where the game begins. This is it. In this position. Kasparov noticed noticed one little thing. This rook is not optimally placed. It is actually a bit of a liability. Don't believe me? You are in for a treat. Oh. What follows is the most mind-blowing combination in chess. So Kasparov looked at the rook on h8 and he played rook takes d4. That's a move and a half. All right, so this is bananas, and there's going to be so, so many variations. And Kasparov calculated so much stuff. <laughs> so when we look at a chess game that's like wild and sacrificial, it could be like a game from Tal, you know, the magician from Riga, and you know, at one point in the game, he's just going to put a piece on some square where it looks like it can just be captured and I think we should, just for fun, count how many times in this game Kasparov puts a piece on a square so that it can just be taken. Or at least it looks like it can just be taken. Because the pawn can take the rook, right? Well, here Tupalov also calculated many moves ahead, but he reached a different conclusion than Gary Kasparov. Because he didn't know. So he played, c takes d4. Now Kasparov is down a pawn and a rook against number 10 in the world. So what would you do? Of course, you play the only move in the position. Rook to e7. So that's the second time now that Kasparov just puts a piece somewhere where it looks like it can just be taken because of course the queen can just capture the rook, right? It can't, but uh, let's just take a quick look. So Kasparov wants to play queen takes d4 with a check. Right now, if he does so, the queen will be able to block the check. So this is a diversion tactic. Let's say to Palov takes, which he didn't. Queen takes e7. Now queen takes d4. Check to the black king. The knight takes away b7 
So the king has to go to b8. Queen b3, check. You can block with the queen or with the bishop. Bishop holds out for longest. So let's say bishop b7. Then knight to c6. That's check. You cannot capture it because the bishop is pinned to the king. So we cannot move the bishop. We also cannot go, crucially, we cannot go to c8 because of the sniper bishop. So a8 and queen a7 mate. But that was not the end of the game. And this is how the game would have ended if it was one of the classic immortal games from back in the 1800s, when the art of defense had not really been perfected yet. But this is not how the game ended. No. So Tupalov sees that he can't take and instead goes up with the king. The king now attacks the knight. Kasparov plays queen takes d4, check. And this is the third time that Kasparov is just hanging a piece. Because of course the knight can just be taken, right? King takes a4. Was what Zubalov played. It's the only move. The rook still hangs. But Kasparov has bigger fresh to pry. He plays b4, check to the king. There's no escape square because of the queen. So, king to a5. The attack rages on. Queen to c3, threatening to just come in with a checkmate on b3. So queen takes d5, up another pawn, and protecting against the checkmate. Kasparov is still looking at this rook. The rook on a8. What role will it play? What is wrong with this square? Kasparov plays rook to a6, threatening checkmate on a6. And that's actually super hard to defend. If you defend with rook d6, we see here an extremely nice idea. King to b2, threatening and stop. Let's just think about it. Look at this. How are you going to stop queen to b3 check? There is no way. But let's say you go maybe rook c8. Queen check. Queen b3 check. Only legal move. Queen takes queen. Queen takes b3. And then c, c takes b3, checkmate. Would you look at that? Three pawns delivering checkmate, backed up by the king. That's just beautiful. So there is no rook d6 defending the checkmate. But Topalov was world number 10. And he went on to actually become a FIDE world chess champion. So he didn't get that far because he didn't know how to defend. No, he found an ultra resourceful defense here with the bishop to b7, protecting the pawn and just giving up the bishop. And Kasparov played rook takes bishop, rook takes b7, of course the queen cannot recapture because of the checkmate, 
But Topalov now has time, because the rook no longer threatens checkmate, to play queen to c4, saying either you exchange the queens, which Kasparov is never going to do in a position like this, or you will get off the attack on b3, so I can get rid of that checkmate idea. Kasparov played queen takes f6, and he begs a knight. He just took two pieces, and he somehow still town material. Because that's that's how Kasparov rolls. Takes, takes two pieces on two consecutive moves, and is still town material. Queen takes f6, threaten queen takes a6, with checkmate, the same idea as before. But here we see Topalov's nice idea. Nice defensive, defensive idea, because now he can play king takes a3. It's very brave, you see an almost aggressive king here. And this means that after queen takes a6, check, this pawn is no longer defending the b4 pawn. So king can play, king takes b4. And Tupalov said in an interview after the game that this position was how far he had calculated when he saw that Kasparov sacrificed his rook. Tupalov calculated this whole sequence and reached this position and he evaluated the position, saying, I am up material. We have the same amount of pawns. I have four. And white has one, two, three, four. I have a rook. You have a rook. I have a queen. You have a queen. But the last one is a rook for a bishop. That's a material advantage to me. And I feel confident in this position. But what about this rook that Kasparov has been looking at? What is it about this rook? And what is the move that Tupalov missed in this position that Kasparov found? When he was calculating whether or not he could sacrifice the rook. Oh, it's a small move. But pawn to c3, check. Oh, that's a beauty. The queen can take c3, because then it is no longer defending b5. So we would see queen takes b5 with a checkmate in 3. So the king has to take. King takes c3. Which allows this hyper hypermaneuverable queen to play queen to a1 check now that's check because we got the king to c3 still looking at this rook because we are still down material and we need a way to win the game and to palov apparently is not too keen on just allowing to checkmate him. Thank God we have the mind of Gary Kasparov to lead us through this game. The king cannot go to d3 because bishop to f1 with a check would pick up the queen. Okay, so the king goes to d2. Kasparov is still not done. Queen b2, check. Tupalov does not want to get on this file here, on the e-file, because then Kasparov could activate his rook with rook to e7 and get a check in. So no, he plays king to d1. And here we see just 
Tvar was still looking at this rock, and we are still in his calculation from the rock sacrifice that occurred all, all those moves ago. And I mean, there's only one move that wins for White here, and it has been so for a long time. Many moves, many tempting moves, many ways you could go wrong. Actually, only ways you could go wrong, except one path to victory. And even this position, even this position you look at here, is tactically hard to, it's tactically hard if I just gave you this position, how long would you take to figure out the correct move? And then, then imagine having to calculate Calculate this, 10 moves ahead, all the other stuff, all the other options that could have been played, that he also had to calculate. And still reach this position in your mind's eye and find the bishop to f1. Now that is the fourth time Kasparov just puts a piece on a square where it can be taken. It's the fourth time. First a rook, then another rook, then a knight, and now a bishop. The problem is, though, that the queen can't take the bishop. Let's let's just see how it how the game would end. Queen takes f1. This is a variation. This didn't occur in the game. And then queen c2 check king e1 rook e7 check only move queen e2 and queen takes queen queen takes e2 checkmate so there is no taking the bishop Kasparov is still looking at this rook because in calculating Bishop f1, he had to, of course, also calculate Topalov's resourceful defense with rook to d2. You take my queen, I take your queen. <laughs> and so what, what do you think Kasparov did? What, did you, what do you think he did? Of course, he picked up one of his pieces, the rook, and he put it on a square where it could just be taken. Rook to d7. And it's just, it's just beautiful. And the point, of course, not of course, but the point is that now the rook actually can't take the queen because it pinned. So now the rook is not threatening the queen. Of course, the rook can't take the rook. And it did. Topalov played rook takes rook on, on d7. Because the exchange is actually, materially, is not that bad. Bishop takes queen. Kasparov played bishop takes c4. And b takes c4. And this material situation is actually better for black. After all of this, we are up a pawn as black. And we have the two rooks. Two rooks worth 10 points combined. The queen only 9. And we are, we are also ahead of pawn. So we are actually ahead with the two points in what would have been a winning endgame if Kasparov had not reached this position in his mind's eye and seen that after all of this queen takes h8 is possible and I mean, the 
the reason I did this key was because I saw an uh, AMA with Kasparov on Reddit and somebody asked him if he really saw this move and he said well I didn't see every single variation but yes when I played rook takes e4 I saw that I had queen takes h8 in the end so that is why this game is considered the most impressive chess game by modern grandmasters. By modern grandmasters. The game is actually not over. And if I had this position, if I was white playing to Balov, I can bet you I would lose 10 out of 10 times. Because black still has still has shots in the still has bullets in the chamber. First he plays rook to d3, attacking the pawn. Queen a8, defending the pawn. But rook was also defending c3, so now he can push pawn to c3. This threatens a check and making a queen, then black would win. So Kasparov plays queen to a4, stopping the advance of the pawn. The king is in check. King e1. Kasparov doesn't want to lose his f-pawn, so he plays f4. We see f5 by black. And the white majesty chases the black king with king c1. And here Topalov tried his last shot with rook d2, attacking a2. And here Kasparov played the best move, of course, which is queen to a7. And Topalov resigned. And why? Well, he had hoped to be able to nap this h-pawn, but but if he captures h2, then queen g1 check picks up the rook, which would be here, so that doesn't work. Also the queen attacks now the base of pawn of black's pawn structure, so these pawns are going to fall. And finally we threaten queen e6 check when you move the rook, or whatever. Whatever you do to try to stop the check, I will pick up your c pawn, which is your only asset, your only advantage you could say you have. So there is no way to get out of the situation. So this is where the game ended. Basically, Topalov is now down a queen for a rook and a pawn. And if you saw how Kasparov could play when he was down that much material, well, then you best believe he can win a game when he's up a queen for a rook. And Topalov recognized that and said, all right. But uh, we give kudos to Topalov because he did not take it lying down. He was absolutely fighting, putting up an extremely impressive defense. And yes, this is just such a chess beauty. So I will end this game with a nice quote by world champion Podvinik uh, about Kasparov. He was teaching some chess students on like some aspiring talents, what should they do against different players. And he said, you know, if Tal sacrifices a piece, take it. If Petrosian sacrifices a piece, don't take it. And if Kasparov sacrifices a piece, resign. <laughs> yeah, Kasparov was a beast, the beast of Baku. That's the video. I hope you enjoyed it. I think this uh, game is just absolutely beautiful. Thanks for watching. See you in the next video.